You might want more Stalingrad videos, you might want more North African campaign videos, or videos on various other battles, campaigns, or economic and political factors, interesting myth-busting videos, etc etc. But no, it turns out that, even though I've come a long way since 2017, having published multiple in-depth videos on World War II, and many battle documentaries, the longest of which is over 9 hours, and is, as far as I'm aware, the longest single documentary on one World War II battle in history, and is about to be outshined by my ongoing Stalingrad series, and the fact that I've recently started to include references directly in the videos, in order to back up what I'm saying, there is a faction out there that insists that nothing I say can be trusted. Because they have been completely annihilated in their debate, they are now resorting to character assassination tactics, because obviously the evidence nor the interpretation supports what they're saying. So, instead of fighting me head on, because they can't, they're flailing around in desperation like the T-1000 at the ending of Terminator 2, trying to come up with any excuse they can to undermine my legitimacy. For example, they claim that I don't have a degree in history, even though I do, and it's worthless. I can save you a ton of money and time by giving you more knowledge than I ever got at university. All you have to do is watch my 48-minute history theory video. You're welcome. But another excuse is the subject of today's video. This faction claim that, because Nigel Lasquet wrote an article refuting one of my videos, and because I never responded to him, I'm wrong. And nothing I've ever said is true, because that makes no sense. I mean, even if Nigel Lasquet was right, and I was wrong, with one of my videos, that doesn't mean I'm wrong everywhere else. Of course, it does to this faction because they're desperate, and will clutch at anything to make them feel like they're right. But for those of us who actually use our brains, no it doesn't. And in reality, the Nigel Askey issue doesn't really have much of an impact on any of the other videos, it's a self-contained issue. The only impact it would have, if Nigel Aske is right, is that the Germans would be classed as superhuman Aryan wonder warriors that only lost the war because they were drowned by hordes of lesser human beings who ran forwards into the German guns like waves of zombies from the Left 4 Dead series. So you might be wondering, why has it taken me so long to reply to Mr. Nigel Aske? His article was written three years ago, and I'm only just getting to it. Is it because I can't refute what he's saying, as the faction claim? No, the faction I mentioned previously had to be defeated first, because it's pointless debating the numbers on the Eastern Front if World War II had never happened in the first place, and World War II wouldn't have happened if Hitler wasn't a National Socialist, which is what this faction claims. So, after spending 18 months crafting a 5 hour video with 107 sources and 350 direct references, plus the fact I built this upon my previous public versus private video, which defeated their ridiculous arguments as to why Hitler wasn't a National Socialist, only to be ignored by the faction who instead rallied behind the pro variable pro-German super-Aryan wonder warrior argument, as well as keeping up with my weekly video publishing schedule, this is really the first opportunity I've had to pick up the Nigel Askey issue in a long time. It's also a Patreon question, so I'm obligated to respond now. Sorry for the delay, Chris. Anyway, Nigel Askey wrote his article in response to two videos of mine, links in the description. In it, he says this. The premise of the video is essentially that the common perception of the German-Soviet loss ratios has been exaggerated, as well as the overall Soviet numerical superiority during the war. In essence, this means the Wehrmacht was not actually that superior in terms of overall combat performance, and the numerical odds against them were never really that bad. I don't agree with the video statistics or the premise they are meant to support. I believe the main premise of the video is wrong at the most fundamental levels, and the presenter shows a complete lack of understanding of what it actually means to be outnumbered by even 2 to 1 in a modern war. Oh no, it gets better. Apparently I almost made Mr. Nigel Askey choke on his coffee. Section 3. A lack of understanding of what it means to be outnumbered by even 2 to 1, especially at the operational level in modern warfare. 
when watching the Utsu presentation, the moment when I almost choked on my coffee came when the presenter said, or at least implied, that being outnumbered 2 to 3 to 1 wasn't really that bad, and it was nothing like the 10 to 1 or so Soviet hordes that some German accounts would have us believe. Well, apart from no one of any significance really ever believing any 10 to 1 stories, except for in the occasional local tactical situation, which undermines what you've just said, I suddenly realised that the presenter had no real understanding of what 2 or 3 to 1 odds because this is now a lottery or something, across the whole front actually meant in real terms, or how this related to combat proficiency. I also soon realised that relatively few people seem to understand what this means. I therefore decided to put down a few facts on what this means in practical terms. It appears that Mr Nigel Askey isn't just saying, I'm an idiot. He's also calling most of you idiots too, because obviously none of us know what being outnumbered really means. Only Mr Nigel Askey knows what being outnumbered really means. So, Mr Nigel Askey, why don't you tell us simpletons what being outnumbered really means? Application of the Lanchester Square Law. <laughs> because the only way to know what being outnumbered really means is to understand the so-called Lanchester Square Law, bearing in mind that there are no laws in history. But do go on. I can't go into the mathematics here. No, you can't, because basic economic theory says you cannot mathematically calculate a prediction of human action. Unless you are a god, and I don't think you're a god, Mr Nigel Askey. I can't go into the mathematics here. The proof of this law is essentially the result of a simple differential equation solution. But this is the result for combat situations. Oh yes, really simple. I hope all you peons out there are keeping up with this. But don't worry if you can't. After the gibberish he's about to spout, I'll put it into actual English for you. Assume side A outnumbers side B by a factor X. If all elements of both sides engage in combat simultaneously, which they won't because that's not how wars work, but do go on. If all elements of both sides engaged in combat simultaneously, then in order for side B to maintain what is termed the force equilibrium ratio, in this case X to 1, then each of side B's men will have to have X squared casualty inflicting efficiency relative to each of side A's men. Thus, if side B is outnumbered 2 to 1, then in order for it to maintain this 2 to 1 ratio over time, the relative casualty inflicting efficiency of side B's men will need to be 4 times that of side A's men. Similarly, if side B is outnumbered 3 to 1, then in order for it to maintain this 3 to 1 ratio over time, the relative casualty inflicting efficiency of side B's men will need to be 9 times that of side A's men. So, in actual English, what he's trying to say is that if the German army is outnumbered 2 to 1, then the German army will need to be 4 times better than the Soviet army in order to maintain this ratio in the field. Why he couldn't just say it like that, I have no idea. And if the Germans are outnumbered 3 to 1, then the German soldiers must be 9 times better than the Soviet soldiers in order to maintain this ratio. Thus, if what I said in the video was true, the Germans were superhuman wonder warriors from space! Because, let's not forget, the Germans held back a 2 or 3 to 1 advantage for 4 years, therefore they must have been literal gods of war. The Wehrmacht needed an average casualty inflicting efficiency superiority of between 4 and 9 at different times to simply prevent itself being rapidly annihilated. But Mr Nigel Askey thinks my numbers are wrong. He thinks there were even more Soviet troops than I said there were. Therefore, Mr Nigel Askey thinks that the Germans were more than 9 times as good as the Soviet soldiers on average. Meaning that some of the German soldiers were one-man armies like Rambo or Arnold Schwarzenegger in the Follywood films. And then he uses the Lanchester Square Law to conclude this. Few people seem to grasp this fact. The general feeling is that a smaller, higher quality force will always sustain fewer casualties against an inferior quality force regardless of the odds. But no. It actually means that 
All other things being equal, having numerical superiority translates directly into fewer casualties in the final count. Also note, the Lanchester Square law also makes a mockery of the myth that the attacking force will necessarily sustain more casualties than the defending force. I generally find that people who still think that being the defender is a major advantage in modern war do not understand the maths, or how simple numerical superiority can have a dramatic effect on the battle's outcome and the casualties sustained. Yes, because we all know that in World War I, the attacker had the advantage. That's why there was stalemate for four years. Also, Rourke's Drift, where a small, higher quality force, was completely wiped out by the inferior Zulus, who definitely took fewer casualties. Oh, okay then. This is why I still get people in the comments saying that the defender is always at a disadvantage in war. I don't know if it all comes from Mr. Nigel Askey, or if he's one of many echoing this fallacy, but it's plainly false. If this was the case, you would never defend. You'd just constantly attack. There would be no need to build castles in medieval times, or fortifications in more modern times. No need for trenches either. You'd just attack, 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 because otherwise you'd lose more than if you decided to defend, which is ridiculous. Mr. Nigel Askey's entire argument here rests on the so-called Lanchester Square Law. I mean, even at face value, this doesn't hold up to scrutiny. First, there are no laws in history, and basic economic theory says you cannot calculate a prediction of reality. But even beyond this, Lanchester was writing in 1914, trying to come up with a mathematical model for previous wars. His calculations were for wars where everyone dressed in brightly coloured uniforms and executed war as though they were marching up and down a parade ground. This law doesn't even apply to modern warfare. It didn't apply to World War I, which was a war unlike any other previously. And even for the wars this law was supposedly designed for, it didn't work. I have here a book called Numbers, Predictions and War, using history to evaluate combat factors and predict the outcome of battles. This was written by Colonel Dupuy, who worked for the US Army. Dupuy explains why the Lanchester Square Law is invalid. Some years ago, Dr. Daniel Willard did a study to test the validity of the Lanchester equations against the best military historical database then available, a massive book called the Kriegs Lexicon by an Austrian historian named Gaston Bodart. This is a compilation of data of some 1,500 battles stretching from the Thirty Years' War in the early 17th century through the Russo-Japanese War in the early 20th century. Willard decided to use this data to test his thesis that every battle is made up of a number of small combats. The results of the test led him to the conclusion that either the Lanchester equations do not apply to historical combat, or the casualty producing power of a force increases as its size decreases, or in other words, a force grows stronger as it incurs casualties. This alternative did not impress him with its logic, and so he concluded that the Lanchester equations could not be supported by historical data. And it turns out that studies on World War II using the Lanchester Square Law also found that the law didn't work. More recently, Dr. Janice Fain decided to make another attempt to relate Lanchester equations to historical data. She reasoned that Willard's unsatisfactory results might have been due to his data. In the first place, the Bodart data did not include any modern combat and covered a wide range of tactics and combat circumstances. She decided to use modern war data, and also to use the most reliable data she could find. Hero 60 engagement database of World War II combat in Italy. Dr. Fane's results were just as disappointing as Dr. Willard's, and remarkably similar. After Dupuy gave her help, she tried again, using different inputs that were based on a different calculation method. To keep things simple, the conclusion was that the Lanchester Square Law was only ever designed for small-scale combat, like two lines of muskets firing at each other. And it sort of worked for that, if you use this other model first. But the Lanchester Square Law didn't work for large-scale combat, not even battles, let alone the entire Eastern Front. So the argument Mr. Nigel Askey is putting forth that the German Aryan supermen were more than nine times as good as the Soviet soldiers, and that defenders don't have the advantage in warfare, is based on a flawed mathematical model that shouldn't even be used in this way, as discovered and explained by two PhDs and a retired colonel from the US military. 
I hope I haven't made you spit out your coffee, Mr. Nigel Askey. But what's weird is that Mr. Nigel Askey even admits that this law can't be used in this way. And he does this in his own article. Being outnumbered on an entire long front, which was the case on the East Front, is actually far worse than being outnumbered to the same level on a single battlefield. This is because, at the tactical level, a superior enemy often has problems concentrating their forces against a defender. Effectively, the defender does not have to engage the enemy simultaneously, so the effect of the Lanchester Square law diminishes. So, you've just admitted that your previous points regarding the Lanchester Square law are completely invalid. What was the point of bringing it up then? Why did I just spend a significant amount of time refuting your ridiculous arguments only for you then to admit that it was invalid anyway? What was that about? You only put that law in there to make it sound like you knew what you were talking about, knowing full well that the average reader wasn't going to question the math or the logic. You knew that us plebs would just see a bunch of algebra, think that the author must be right, and then just side with you. And you were right. A bunch of people did just that. Well, I hope those people are watching now because this is a clear example of why you should always be asking the question, but is this really the case? You've got to ask, what is this author trying to do? If they're using posh language to talk over you or past you, and are using algebra in a history debate, chances are they're doing that to make it seem like they have more authority on the topic than they actually have. Not only that, but at the end of the article, Mr. Nigel Askey then says, To get a properly balanced picture and understand better why so many learned historians rate the German army, I would also recommend books like Numbers, Predictions and War by Colonel Trevor Dupuy. Wow, talk about an own goal. Is this a joke? Is this a joke? Am I living in the Twilight Zone or something? Why have you recommended a book that undermines your own argument? I don't understand. If you wanted the reader to get a balanced picture of the German army, and that balanced picture is the one that you're supposedly championing, then surely you wouldn't recommend a book that invalidates your own point of view. If you made a point of saying that you use a host of different sources, including the ones you don't agree with, and then listed this book as part of a bibliography, then yeah, I'd understand. But recommending this book as a way to get a proper and balanced view of the German army of World War II, only to find that this book doesn't support what you're saying and actually undermines it, makes zero sense to me. Also, of your other recommendations, the book Fighting Power was originally written in 1982, and Dupuy's book was written in the 1960s, prior to the opening of the Soviet archives. Equally, Stolfi's and Newton's books were written in 2003 and 1994, meaning that their numbers, methods and conclusions are going to be out of date, as Glantz makes clear in the preface of the 2015 expanded and revised edition of When Titans Clashed. Yawning gaps still existed in the historical record of the war in 1995, the most vexing of which was the paucity of accurate numbers quantifying the scope and ferocity of the struggle. Now, most of the gaps have been filled and the missing numbers are becoming readily available. With this passage of time, the amount of archival materials available to flesh out an accurate description of the war, particularly from the Soviet perspective, has increased more than a hundredfold. Up to 60% of the war's content remained largely conjecture in 1995, but by 2015, this figure had decreased to roughly 10%. As a result, clarity is replacing opaqueness and truth is steadily winning out. What this should make clear to you is that newer secondary sources, history books, are going to be more accurate than older secondary sources. Back in 2017 when I made my original videos, the sources I used were some of the latest to come out. The expanded and revised 2015 edition of When Titans Clashed, the 2016 edition of Enduring the Whirlwind, and 2017 edition of The Price of Victory. Now, Mr. Nigel Askey dismisses the sources I used in his article, which we'll get to shortly. But the point is, the sources he's recommending are out of date. To recommend old and out of date history books to readers is a questionable practice at best. Students of history should be picking up the best books available, which in this case, because of the opening of the Soviet archives, are the more modern ones. 
But the reason he's recommending the old books, of course, is because few of the newer books support what Mr. Nigel Askey is saying. And they don't support what he's saying because he's trying to maintain the old pro-German narrative in the face of new evidence. Historians are only as good as the sources they have. If their sources are wrong or out of date, then the historians are going to come to wrong or out-of-date conclusions. My sources might be wrong, and I fully accept that if they are. And I'm glad that Mr. Nigel Askey is giving me another opportunity to say to you guys that you need to do your own reading and come to your own conclusions. While you can favour my arguments, you can't take what I say for granted, because I may have made mistakes or have chosen bad sources. You should take what I do and go beyond it. This is why I do recommend books in my videos and encourage you to pick them up. I'm not doing that because I'm trying to sell you other people's books or whatever. I'm doing that because I know that history lies in the heart of the debate. The only way for you to discover the truth is for you to read multiple sources and come to your own subjective conclusions based on what you read. You can favour certain historians, and I do, but make your own interpretations and don't just believe everything you see or hear. As you've seen already, an article by a published historian has major flaws in it, and I emphasise the word published because the faction I spoke of earlier like to emphasise that word too. By their logic, because Mr Nigel Askey is a published author, that makes him a better historian than me. And he might be a better historian than me. But if he is, it's not because he's published. Anyone can publish their work these days, and a lot of books that are published are a load of rubbish, like anything that Karl Marx wrote. These videos are published. That doesn't necessarily mean they're good nor bad, it just means they're available for you to watch. Well, similarly, Nigel Askey is published, otherwise you wouldn't be able to get a hold of what he says. But that doesn't necessarily mean that what he says is right or wrong, it just means it's available to pick up. Similarly, Nigel Askey published his article, and as you're probably quickly realising, it has major flaws in it. So it being published is irrelevant if it's wrong. Even though they're newer, my sources could be wrong. And Mr Nigel Askey seems to think they are. So, Let's now look at what he says about them. Why the presentation, the numbers say it all, the myth of German superiority in the World War II Eastern Front is misleading. Examples of the selected and hence misleading statistics, and why some of the rationale used is ill-founded. Notice what Mr Nigel Askey says here. He's saying, because the sources were selected, they are misleading. But what exactly does he mean by this? If he means this in the literal sense, that I've selected sources and have not used all the available sources, therefore those sources I have selected are misleading, then the selected sources that Mr Nigel Askey uses would also be misleading. And I guess all history would be misleading, since historians select sources as part of the historical process. Time passes, therefore, yet no historian can hope to capture every passing moment. As I write this, I can hear the click of my fingers on the word processor, the faint whine of the computer in the background, the dull but constantly varying roar of the traffic in the main road across the garden, twittering of the birds outside, the light ticking of the clock on my desk, the soft padding of my cat as he comes up the stairs, the sound of my own breathing, and so on. All this in a handful of seconds, and already it has gone beyond any hope of complete or accurate reconstruction, least of all in the exact sequence in which these noises have come to my ears. So we all pull out from the seamless web of past events a tiny selection which we then present in our historical account. Nobody has ever disputed this. The dispute arises when some theorists believe that the selection is largely determined by the narratives and structures which occur in the past itself, and those who think it is imposed by the historian. So hopefully, Mr Nigel Askey is not saying that my failure to use every source in the universe makes me wrong, because that would be ridiculous, and he would be guilty of it too. Instead, by saying I'm selecting sources, Mr Nigel Askey is implying something far worse. He's accusing me of only using sources that prop up the argument that I'm trying to make, and therefore I'm not using sources that go against my point of view. 
The implication of this is that I'm not being honest to the viewer, and if taken to the logical conclusion, this is an accusation of me distorting history. Now, Mr. Nigel Askey doesn't say whether I'm doing this distortion deliberately or not. It appears, based on the language used, that he just thinks that I have a complete lack of understanding and don't have a properly balanced picture, or I'm simply not a learned historian. But the implication is clear. He's saying I've distorted history. And indeed, a lot of people came to that conclusion after reading his article and now say that Nigel has called me out on my inaccuracies and distortions of history. This video presentation is based almost entirely on selected tables and data from three sources, books. Again, the use of the word selected has sinister connotations because of the previous implication that I've distorted history. In reality though, selecting tables and sources is perfectly fine. But he goes on. Therefore, we need to know a bit more about these sources and how reliable they are. On its own, this is a fair sentence. However, because it comes straight after the previous one and the heading, its inclusion here implies to the reader that the following sources are not reliable. Otherwise, why would we be inclined to scrutinize them to the extent that we're about to do? If Mr. Nigel Askey thought that these were good sources, he wouldn't have proceeded to scrutinize them and would have simply engaged the numbers as they are and then explained why he agreed and disagreed with them in the process. As it is, the reason why Mr. Nigel Askey is taking a full section of the article to scrutinize the sources is because he wants to show the reader how distorted these sources and authors are in his view. The first source he scrutinizes is the price of victory. This recent book's primary focus is to correct the mistakes, deliberate or and otherwise, in the well-known Krivashev work on Soviet World War II casualties, see below on this work. It also seeks to correct the totally ridiculous, irrecoverable Soviet axis loss ratios presented in the Krivashev work. As far the Soviet irrecoverable losses, killed, missing, and POWs are concerned, it is an excellent book and extremely well researched with many sources used. So far, this isn't a particularly damning assessment, but then Mr. Nigel Askey brings on the criticism. However, this is where it stops. This whole work only focuses on irrecoverable losses, killed, missing POWs. It totally ignores all wounded and other casualty types. There is absolutely no mention anywhere of the millions of Soviet wounded, etc. during World War II. It does mention the wounded, Mr. Nigel Askey. Appendix A, for example, lists the wounded casualties. In chapter 1, in the second paragraph, it lists the wounded and then says refer to Appendix A. How can a book with this title not mention the approximately 18,319,700 wounded and sick on the Eastern Front in World War II, data from Krivashev? No, it lists 13,960,000 wounded, minus those who died of wounds in the hospitals, which they counted as dead. It also notes number of wounded includes not only those who were wounded once, but also those who were repeatedly wounded two, three, or more times. Because, of course, a soldier can be wounded multiple times, be patched up, and then sent back into the lines. In fact, Jason D. Mark, in books such as Panzerkrieg, actually says how many men were wounded and how many stayed with the troops since they were lightly wounded and were patched up. And he's referring to the German figures. Halder also notes in his diary, wounded, we have 60% recoveries. But of course, the wounded figures will skew the statistics, because each soldier can have multiple wounds, be patched up, and then sent back to the front. This is why the price of victory lists the disabled Soviet soldiers separately as 2,576,000. But this isn't good enough for Mr. Nigel Askey. How can a book with this title not mention the approximately 18,319,700 wounded and sick on the East Front in World War II, data from Krivashev? A huge number were permanently disabled with lost limbs and other massive injuries. Although called recoverable losses, a great many, well over a third, were not recoverable in any military sense. So, Mr. Nigel Askey uses Krivashev's inflated figure of 18,319,700 Soviet wounded and says that well over a third of them were not recoverable. 
Well, a third, or 33%, of Krivashev's number is 6,045,501. He also says that the price of victory doesn't list the wounded or the disabled. He's wrong. The wounded figure they use is 13,960,000, and they say that the number of disabled is 2,576,000. Both these figures are considerably lower than the statistics that Nigel's favouring at this particular moment, which are the Krivashev statistics. They then note that soldiers can receive multiple wounds from battle, which Mr. Nigel Aske fails to mention in his article. He then says, this, the price of victory, completely suits the Soviet side slash agenda in this debate, as we will see below. This sentence requires a bit of assessment because it shows several things. First, coming at the end of the paragraph where Mr. Nigel Aske states that the source failed to list the wounded, when in fact it did, he now in this sentence makes it clear that the source failed to do this because it completely favours the Soviet side slash agenda. Well, this accusation is false because the price of victory does state the wounded and disabled. So this entire paragraph is wrong in its build-up to the last concluding sentence, giving the reader a distorted view of the source in question. Based solely on the accusations made by Mr. Nigel Aske in this particular paragraph, he has failed to provide evidence that the price of victory completely favours the Soviet side and or agenda. Apart from the accusation based on the lack of evidence presented by Mr. Nigel Aske, the price of victory may have just set out to correct Krivashev's flawed data for the sake of accuracy. In fact, if they had wanted to completely favour the Soviet side and downplay the losses, they could have just used Stalin's own numbers and said the Soviets only lost 7 million people in total, which they point out in the first two paragraphs. In response to questions from a Pravda correspondent on 14th of March 1946, Joseph Stalin officially announced for the first time the magnitude of USSR losses during the Great Patriotic War. As a result of the German invasion, the Soviet Union irrecoverably lost around 7 million people in fighting against the Germans, as well as through the German occupation and penal servitude of Soviet people in German forced labour camps. With this statement, the leader charted the course for the falsification of the history of the Great Patriotic War and the underestimation of Soviet casualties in order to cover up his political and strategic mistakes and miscalculations on the eve and during the first half of the war, which brought the country to the brink of disaster. Second, the source doesn't completely suit or favour the Soviet side, because their stated losses are still far higher than what the Germans sustained, and still paint a picture of a Soviet disaster. Yes, they may be lower than some of the previously given figures, but that doesn't necessarily mean it favours the side in question. If these numbers were 100% correct and accurate, should we not use them? Why? Because they supposedly completely suit the Soviet side? Like, surely accuracy is more important than side-taking. Third, Mr. Nigel Aske is placing emphasis on the supposed fact that this source is skewed in the Soviet's favour. And that's the problem Mr. Nigel Aske has with it. Now, is this because he's concerned that it's too one-sided? Or is it because he's backing one side over the other? Well, Mr. Nigel Aske refers to the Soviet side and the German side several times each in his 13-page article. However, on three occasions, he adds in the word agenda, implying dark connotations of deliberate distortions. And does he do this for the German side? No, he only uses it when he refers to the Soviet side. This completely suits the Soviet side slash agenda in this debate. The chart only focuses on irrecoverable losses, as this totally suits the Soviet-slash-Russian side's apparent agenda. Why Lopukovsky and Kavalierchik couldn't do such a simple and obvious adjustment, even with poor and inaccurate German source data, is very hard to understand. Unless, of course, their agenda is to maximise apparent German irrecoverable losses. This, I think, quite clearly illustrates that Mr. Nigel Aske is taking sides, and it tells us exactly which side Mr. Nigel Aske is on. Rather than looking objectively at the war, Mr. Nigel Aske is taking a pro-German stance. He's on the German side, which explains why he's so keen to present the Germans as amazing soldiers in World War II, capable of taking on more than nine times their number. This is also why he's unfairly dismissive of any source, as I've just shown, that disputes his pro-German view of the conflict. 
and we'll see some more of this side taking as we move on. I would like to point out at this point that I'm not on either side. I know there's a lot of people out there who can't seem to fathom this, but I think both sides of this conflict are evil. My objective is not to favour one side or another, but to tell accurate history. If the German soldiers or generals do well in one instant, I'll praise them. If they do bad in the next, I'll criticise them. And the same applies with the Soviets and the British and the Americans and so on. This is why, in a recent Stalingrad video of mine, I had one commenter accusing me of being pro-German. At the same time, another was accusing me of being pro-Soviet. If this fact doesn't scream, and I'm being as neutral as possible, I don't know what else does. Of course, agendas do exist, and people do push them. However, to say that the price of victory is pushing an agenda based on a false accusation, as Mr. Nigel Laske does in this paragraph, is unfair. But he goes on. Even worse, the German side's data relies entirely on one source, namely Overman's statistical survey, see below, on Wehrmacht casualties, and absolutely no effort is used to ratify the figures used in this very controversial and problematic work. For starters, they do use multiple German sources as listed in their bibliography. Second, their work is focused on the Soviet side, not as much on the German side, and so they only actually get to the German side in Chapter 5, about two-thirds of the way through the book. Third, they examine the claims of multiple German authors listing their own data. They start with Müller Hillebrandt, which Kryvashev lists, then the US Army's Department of History, which was basically run by Halder, although they failed to mention that. Then they mention Fighting Power by Martin van Creveld, which Mr. Nigel Aske should be familiar with because this was one of his recommended reading books listed in his article. Another German author called Fritz Hans, as well as others. They do talk about Rudiger Overman's work and say, All of Overman's information was calculated and, according to the majority of specialists, somewhat overstated. In general, and on a whole, his completely independent research agreed quite well with Müller Hillebrand's results, and once again only served to positively confirm its correctness. Thus, the total personnel resources that Germany's military leadership had at its disposal during the entire Second World War were fewer than Krivashev's number by the very 3,214,000 men whom he had completely groundlessly added. Yes, the authors of The Price of Victory not only showed that a lot of German sources used Overman's numbers, but also pointed out that Overman's numbers were overstated, and then used Overman's figures to show how Krivashev's numbers were too high. So, their use of Overman's was not to completely suit the Soviet side slash agenda, as Mr. Nigel Aske accused, or as Krivayashev had done, but rather to correct Krivayashev's pro-Soviet mistake. In this instance, the authors actually favoured the German side, the total opposite of what Mr. Nigel Aske is claiming. After doing some calculations, they came to a figure for German irrecoverable losses which was 37% lower than Krivayashev's calculations. Again, this favours the German side, not the Soviet side, as Mr. Nigel Aske asserts. But he goes on. Likewise, their treatment of the Axis Allied casualties is totally cursory and at a high level, with very few references shown. This is complete rubbish. Ironically, Lukopovsky and Kavalirchik are guilty of the very crime they accuse Krivashev of, namely treating a single source as sacrosanct, and without any proper debate or cross-checking of the casualty figures quoted, in this case on the German Axis side. This is also complete rubbish. It's clear that Mr. Nigel Aske hasn't read this source, or if he has, he hadn't when he wrote his article in response to me, Otherwise, he wouldn't be making such false accusations. Then he gets to Glantz's book. When Titans Clashed, How the Red Army Stopped Hitler by David Glantz, 2010. Nope, sorry, I'm using the 2015 revised and expanded edition, not the 2010 edition. This well-known work is a very good overall history of the East Front, but told very much from the Soviet perspective, as are many of Glantz's books, but this one in particular. I would even go as far as to say this work, which I have thoroughly studied, is mostly biased in the Soviets' favour, unlike many of Glantz's later and better works. 
We are all biased. We're not gods. However, if by bias you mean that glance is favouring the Soviet side, which is what you're implying, where is your evidence for this? As stated earlier, Glantz is now using the new Soviet sources which were only just being released at this point. Historians like Glantz and most of my viewers will have been spoon-fed the German perspective our entire lives through books, TV documentaries and gibberish on online history forums. What we haven't got even now is the full Soviet perspective, and that is what we so desperately need in order to combat the ridiculous pro-German bias that exists in practically every Western history book. Glantz may be leaning on and presenting a more Soviet perspective, but this isn't necessarily a pro-Soviet bias. This is to re-tip the scales away from a super pro-German camp to a more balanced middle ground. And this is why the pro-German camp can't stand it, because this undermines their pro-Aryan super warrior narrative. It is now quite old, first published in 1995 with this new edition in 2010. The new edition has some updated data, mainly adding Operation Mars, but still relies almost exclusively on Krivoshev's work to supply key information like the front strengths as used in Table N, as well as casualties. Again, the version I'm using is more up to date and has been expanded. Secondly, there might have been a reason why I used the price of victory as a counter to Krivoshev's out-of-date figures, because I understood that Krivoshev's numbers were flawed. I even said this in the video. This time we're going to look at Glantz, who's relying on Krivoshev, whose numbers are disputed, but we'll get into them anyway, just in case. Yes, I did point out to the viewer that the numbers were disputed, and yes, perhaps I could have spent a little more time explaining why they were disputed, and why I chose to use the statistics that I did, and that's a fair point. But one, that's not the criticism being laid against me and my video. The criticism is that I deliberately selected sources and thus distorted history, even though, in reality, I deliberately selected sources that didn't agree with each other. And two, I can, if asked, explain why I chose the statistics that I did. And so, let me explain why I picked those statistics. The reason I went with Glantz's numbers, even though they relied on Krivasheyev, is because those numbers provided an almost month-by-month -month breakdown, allowing me to progress through the war, rather than just get one giant number for the whole war and one giant distorted picture. The price of victory didn't separate its numbers into monthly totals, so I had no choice but to use Glantz in this instance. Now, you might say, but if the price of victory's numbers are the better numbers, then surely it would be wrong to use the Krivayashev numbers. Well, for starters, I did use both. But also, you're forgetting that all statistics are flawed. The price of victory's numbers may be better, but as Nigel Askey himself has shown, he thinks they're wrong. So, no matter what set of statistics I choose, I would have been wrong. So, knowing this, I used both sets of statistics. I used the price of victory statistics at the beginning, showing yearly totals, and then proceeded to work through the Glantz and Krivayashev numbers, showing an almost month-by-month -month breakdown. I also used statistics from Enduring the Whirlwind, also disputed by Nigel Askey, as we'll see. And I compared all three lots of statistics to each other when it was possible to do that. In addition, I pointed this out. I gave warnings that the numbers were disputed, even stating that the price of victory's numbers may be a little conservative. And my sources were listed so that viewers could do more reading if they so desired. Therefore, this wasn't me deliberately selecting sources to distort history or favour what I was saying. And I can reasonably justify the use of all the statistics. Because here's the bottom line. No matter which set of statistics you use, or whether you use them all like I did, they're all pointing in the same direction. Yes, the numbers themselves might vary, but they're giving us a general feeling of what was happening on the Eastern Front in World War II, which is the general feeling I laid out to you in the video. And if you are one of these people who doesn't trust what other people say, or doesn't trust any set of statistics that come out, regardless of who created them, then don't click on a video titled The Numbers Say It All, because it's obvious that I'm going to be talking about numbers. Also, don't watch any documentary or read any history book, and don't read the original sources, because obviously every source is written by human hands, 
that are powered by human brains, and all people are biased, so if you don't trust anyone regardless of what they say, and you don't accept history theory, which says that debate will overcome the biases inherent in the sources, then fiction might suit you better than history. This brings us to Nigel Askey's assessment of the book Enduring the Whirlwind. This new book's focus is generally on the German army's condition, replacements, etc. in the period in question. It focuses well on the specific question, but it is really a specialised work with a lot of specialised strength and smaller unit replacement data presented. The data that is presented is well researched and referenced and accurate as far as I can see. Oh good, I'm glad to have picked up a book that Nigel likes. Oh wait, spoke too soon. However, I personally found the book difficult to digest in that it's difficult to see where the author is going. Well, we're not here for a book review of the author's writing abilities. We're here to discuss the statistics. His basic premise is fine, and I generally agreed with this. Namely, the German army was not inevitably worn down or fatally weakened by its casualties in 1941-43. However, he is not convincing enough because he does not present overall data across the whole theatre on German casualties and replacements, so it is impossible for the reader to gauge the German army's overall condition across the front at any point in time. So, you generally agree with the premise, but it isn't convincing enough for you to agree with the premise which you generally agree with, even though you've not been convinced. I'm really glad we had this talk. Also, he does provide overall data across the whole theatre of German casualties and replacements. Table 5.6 on page 267, Table 5.8 on page 269, and Table 6.7 on page 311, just to name a few. In fact, I showed at least one of these in the video. So perhaps you should be convinced now, Mr. Nigel Askey. The text also often descends into a sort of general history of the war. It even uses some maps taken directly from some of Glantz's works. You've not read the book, have you, Mr. Nigel Askey? There is little to no discussion of German supply and logistics at critical points in time, a critical element missing from the book and which would have made it really useful. I love logistics too, but we're not here for the logistics, we're here for the casualty figures, so this is irrelevant. Like Glantz, Liedke uses Krivashev data for Soviet figures and German archival data for German figures. He does, and he also uses other statistics too. Why? Because he's using a convergence of evidence to give a general feel of what's happened, like I'm doing. He's not relying on one source of information, he's using multiple, which is what historians should be doing. Mr. Nigel Askey goes on to talk about the Krivashev study and Overman statistics. I won't bore you with the Krivashev one because we'll just be going over the same points we've already been through, namely that all statistics are flawed. Instead, his assessment of Overman's study is very interesting. There is also strong evidence that the entire Overman study was commissioned for political reasons, in order to demonstrate that Germany was, again, not hesitant about its role in World War II, and was not in any way attempting to minimise its losses and involvement. No doubt this was very admirable. So, Mr. Nigel Askey doesn't like it, because it's not trying to downplay German losses on the Eastern Front. By his own words, he only trusts sources about German casualties that downplay their losses. But the study was not designed or focused on reviewing military casualties by operation or by type for military history purposes, but much more on demographic distribution and overall theatre losses. Unfortunately, there are many problems with using Overman's study to compare military casualties, which would in itself warrant a whole essay, so I cannot go into them all here. The first key point is that it is a statistical sample study, and not a meticulous archival study. A sample less than 10,000 was taken on the German military personnel records, and their fate and where this occurred were recorded. Well, part of the reason why is because the German records are incomplete. As Overmans himself points out, the official numbers would therefore downplay German losses, which is why a sample was necessary. But I agree that the Overman study isn't fully accurate, as are no set of statistics. However, Mr. Nigel Askey's second point is one that I do disagree with. These irrecoverable looses include deaths from all organisations, including those not directly under Wehrmacht command and operating in deep rear areas. These include organisations like the police, OT, RAD, Volkssturm, militia, security intelligence forces, even those operating against partisans, resistance fighters or enemy intelligence elements, etc. 
It also includes all Waffen SS casualties, which are usually listed separately in the OKW BA archival reports. Therefore, the Overman study is the maximum possible number killed, missing in action, or prisoners of war, regardless of where they came from. It turns out that in many cases, this results in a gross exaggeration of front losses. Hold, hold on, so you're saying that German casualty figures should not include the Waffen SS or the Volkssturm or German security forces, which did fight on the front line during the Kurland Pocket, for example. You're criticizing statistics that include, let's say, a quarter of the German forces on the Eastern Front. Oh, and you're also saying don't include casualties sustained against partisan forces or enemy intelligence elements, which is obviously a big part of the war. And the reason, of course, is that partisans or cut-off Red Army units behind the lines did a lot of damage to the German army in the East. But if you included that, you'd also have to mention that the noble German army of World War II participated in anti-partisan operations, which involved burning entire villages to the ground and killing or enslaving or socializing the women and children. And you're obviously glossing over the fact that Overmans didn't include wounded or sick because, once again, he knew that they would distort the statistics, just like the authors of The Price of Victory pointed out. Now, I'm not defending Overmans. I think his study is flawed. But I also think you're being a little too unfair on him. However, it's becoming very clear that Mr. Nigel Askey doesn't like statistics that don't make the German army out to be the greatest fighting force the world has ever seen. With the above in mind, let us now examine a few of the problems with the main statistical spreadsheet shown to support the presentation. 1. The Irrecoverable Losses comparison table used at the start of the presentation, taken from page 133 of the book The Price of Victory. Problem 1, and a massive problem slash omission. The chart only focuses on irrecoverable losses as this totally suits the Soviet slash Russian side's apparent agenda. Surely, if you want to compare the true relative combat performance, tactical or operational, then all types of casualties must be included, especially those wounded in combat. This is because wounded are the direct result of enemy action, ordnance, the result of the enemy attempting to inflict the maximum possible casualties, their so-called casualty inflicting efficiency, and often three to five times higher higher than their irrecoverable losses, especially and often in an attacking force. Likewise, even those sick enough to be unfit for service can be classified as operational casualties largely due to enemy action. How can wounded possibly be ignored in any discourse on this subject? The answer is, they can't. No, the answer is that the wounded and sick distort the figures because, again, you can be wounded multiple times and be sick multiple times, as explained in the book. So, if you want a more accurate representation of the war in statistical form, removing the wounded and sick numbers is probably the best way to do it. Also, if someone is sick, how is that the fault of the enemy? And why does that count towards their combat efficiency? That doesn't make any sense. Now, yes, we can talk about the wounded and sick, and we shouldn't ignore them, and the price of victory doesn't ignore them. It just took them out of this chart, but... If we're trying to figure out how effective both sides were, then we must remove those wounded and sick from the combat statistics. But Mr. Nigel Askey seems to have not realised this. To really hammer home this point, consider the following data from one of the most respected and reputable World War II historians in the world, namely Nicholas Zetterling. Never heard of him. And he's only got half a dozen books published. Not that he's not a great historian or anything, but being a great historian doesn't necessarily mean he can't be wrong. Mr. Zetterling is foremost in his meticulous research in the German archives and widely acknowledged as such. He has a far more formidable reputation than Overman's, and in terms of archival research in the German archives, is comparable to Glantz's research into the Russian archives. In this case, casualties include killed, wounded, missing, POW, sick, and unfit for service. Mr. Zetterling may be respected, maybe. But he's not realised, like Overman's did, that including the sick and wounded distorts the picture. Then Mr. Nigel Askey provides this chart on page 5. He has corrected the Soviet losses with the price of victory's numbers, but hasn't corrected the German losses to show the additional soldiers that died, as outlined in the price of victory and by Overman's or by other German historians, because that will go against his narrative. So straight away, just like all statistics, these statistics are flawed. But on top of that, he later says this. 
Firstly, the German figures are for Army Herr only, and exclude Luftwaffe, Kriegsmarine and Waffen-SS casualties. This is despite the fact that the Waffen-SS was obviously a huge factor in the war in the East, and that Luftwaffe divisions, regiments and battalions participated in the ground fighting in the East, such as at Stalingrad, as did some naval infantry units. Taking them out of the picture means that these statistics are now incomplete, again downplaying the German losses. He then says, Secondly, the Soviet figures are not corrected for NKVD casualties, as these were not administratively under the Red Army, similar to the Waffen-SS and OKH in the NKVD combat units. Soviet figures are also not corrected for the additional losses shown in the recent Price of Victory study. The reader should therefore add around 1,846,000 Soviet casualties over the course of the period above to correct for this. So, we're not allowed to include the Waffen-SS, but we are to include the NKVD. Talk about double standards. But what Nigel fails to say is that the NKVD have already been included in the Soviet figures. So what he's actually doing here is wanting the reader to add the NKVD figures in again to mitigate any change that would occur by adding in the Waffen-SS and so on. Very sneaky. Of course, the exclusion of the Waffen SS is for three reasons. One, even though the Waffen SS fought alongside the German army and was subordinate to it and used the same equipment as it, the pro German side liked to pretend it was separate from the German army because, two, this gives the pro German side an excuse to avoid talking about the crimes against humanity committed by both the Waffen SS and the German army, allowing them to whitewash the German army. And three, despite having priority in terms of equipment and Aryan super warriors, the Waffen SS wasn't actually that good at fighting, so including them in the statistics would make the German side look worse. But just looking at the table as it is, notice the picture that's now being presented by these figures. He's actually downplaying the ratio in 1941 and boosting it for the subsequent years. What does this imply? It implies that the German army was consistently good throughout the war, although getting slowly worse as they were getting swarmed by hordes of Red Army men and tanks. The conclusion would be that the German army could have won if only they hadn't been whittled down constantly over time and that German divisions were like rocks drowning in a sea of Red Army waves. In comparison, the ratio I presented tells a different narrative that the German army did exceptionally well in 1941, and then not so much over the next three years. And in fact, by 1944, the German army was at a ratio of 1 to 1, meaning that they were equal to the Red Army in terms of casualties sustained. This suggests that the German army must have had an advantage in 1941, which they didn't have in the remainder of the war, and as I showed later in the video, the reason why is because they actually outnumbered the Soviets at any one moment in time during the first several months of the war, until they got to Moscow. Subsequent videos of mine have shown that German logistics broke down outside Moscow, and that they ran out of oil reserves in the October of 1941, amongst other reasons. Others have explained how the Red Army Air Force and the Red Army Artillery were totally unprepared for Operation Barbarossa, and that their tank part consisted of mostly light tanks that the German infantry could easily destroy. And I've done videos giving more examples besides this, so I can actually back up this point of view with further evidence. But regardless which narrative you believe, in my view, this table that's presented by Mr. Nigel Askey is deeply flawed and gives the reader the wrong impression. Yet, he doesn't seem to think so. Even if we add all these corrections to both sides, the numbers involved still do not significantly change the ratio shown in the above table, and are nowhere near the loss ratio shown in the presentation, especially the 1943 and 1944 ratios. Well, of course, the reader is just taking this statement on faith, since you didn't provide another chart. But don't worry, I've done the work for them. Here's the chart with the SS added in, but not doubling up on the NKVD, as Mr. Nigel Askey wanted us to do. By adding the totals up, the original chart presented a ratio of 2 to 11, versus my 2 to 5. But adding in the additions, the ratio slips down to 2 to 9, versus 2 to 5. Obviously the ratio doesn't match, however the point is, Mr. Nigel Askey said that the ratios wouldn't change if we added the corrections in. Except they do. The ratio is coming down and is more in favour of my view 
even though we haven't added in the Luftwaffe ground troops, the security units, and have just taken the Waffen SS figure at face value. Equally telling is that even if we substitute Overman's irrecoverable loss data on the BA archival irrecoverable loss data, i.e. assume Overman's figures are correct and accurate, by including wounded and other casualties the ratios are still very much in the German favour and still nowhere near the loss ratio shown in the presentation. But again, if you don't include the wounded and sick, which you shouldn't, and took them out for both sides, then you'd get the ratio I showed in the video, and is the ratio shown in the price of victory. So the only way we don't get your numbers is if we don't recognise that the wounded and sick have to be taken out of the numbers. In other words, any such comparisons without considering all casualty types is next to meaningless and actually quite useless in further studies, such as for analysing relative overall combat proficiencies, ROCPs. Incorrect. Adding in the wounded and sick distorts the picture and makes the statistics meaningless. Problem 2. In the table from the price of victory, the German allies are treated mathematically as though they were exactly like the German Wehrmacht and Waffen SS soldiers. It is assumed that they had the same training, equipment, leadership, support, etc, which is completely ridiculous. No, what you're doing is leaving out the Axis Allied armies, but including all the Soviet troops and allies that fought on the Eastern Front, and then using that to show how the German army killed so many more troops than they actually did. In reality, the Axis Allied armies fought against the Red Army and inflicted losses upon them. The Red Army couldn't ignore the Axis Allied armies and just concentrate on the Germans. So the Axis Allies have to be included in the overall statistics for them to have any meaning. This is why the price of victory included them, and they explain this in Chapter 6. Also, nobody is assuming that the Axis Allies were the same quality as the German forces. But it would be ridiculous to say, well, they're not the same quality as the German forces, therefore we shouldn't count them at all, but still count the kills that the Axis Allied armies inflicted on the Red Army and pass them off as German kills, which is exactly what you're arguing. Despite all this, Slupakovsky and Kavalierchik have casually added 1,038,700 German Allied irrecoverable losses to the German 4,941,600 irrecoverable losses in the chart. Mathematically, this means that Wehrmacht effectively fielded and lost over an additional million soldiers. Completely absurd. Incorrect. Nobody is arguing that the Wehrmacht lost an additional 1 million soldiers. We're arguing that the Axis Allies lost 1 million soldiers, and that you can't ignore this when discussing the casualty figures on the Eastern Front. Removing them, but then not taking out the kills they inflicted on the Red Army, at the very least, is a massive distortion of the statistics. But even if you did that, the impact that these Axis Allied troops had on the campaign is huge, even if they just held the line at certain points. Why? because they tied down Red Army units, preventing them from engaging German units. So, in reality, you'd have to remove a chunk of the Red Army from the statistics too, which would be almost impossible to do accurately. Therefore, you must include them in the statistics in order for the statistics to not be meaningless. The Soviet Allies' losses are treated in the same way, but here a paltry 119,400 casualties are considered over the whole war. I don't see a problem with this. They need to be included. The only reason you may object to this is because the Germans relied on a lot more Allied forces than the Soviets. And so, if you count all the Allies on both sides, this actually shows that the German kill ratio was lower than the amazing figure you'd like to imagine it was. What should have been done, and what would have been reasonable, is to assume the German Allied forces inflicted around a 1 to 1 kill loss ratio on the Soviet and Soviet Allied forces, while the remaining Soviet and Soviet Allied casualties were sustained in combat with the German forces. What? Why? I can't believe you're even suggesting this! What happens if the Soviet Allied forces were better than the regular Red Army units? What if the Axis Allied units actually inflicted a lot of casualties on the Red Army? Why must we assume that they were all the same? 
Imagine if the Romanians killed twice as many Red Army soldiers as they sustained losses. By assuming that they only killed the same amount as they sustained, these extra kills would go to the German numbers, which would make the German army look better than it was in reality and distort the true picture of what happened on the Eastern Front. And yet, that is exactly the very argument you're presenting in this article. Then we get another chart, with Nigel Asquet changing the numbers again. But what's interesting is that, even though he's adjusted the numbers to suit his flawed logic, the ratio still doesn't reach the 2 to 11 ratio that he presented earlier. It also shows that the overall picture of the war favours the view I presented in the video, that Germany did well in the first year of the war, then not so well from 1942 onwards. It doesn't show the Nigel Askey narrative that the Germans were consistent throughout the war. Why Lepkowski and Kavalierczyk couldn't do a simple and obvious adjustment, even with poor and inaccurate German source data, is very hard to understand. Unless, of course, their agenda is to maximise apparent German irrecoverable losses, but this is really treating the reader without any respect at all. But again, they were justified in doing what they did, and their agenda, there's that word again, wasn't to maximise German losses. Their agenda was to be faithful to the evidence and present as accurate a picture of the Eastern Front as possible. Yet your agenda seems to be quite the opposite, to maximise Soviet losses and minimise German losses. And you know what? I'd like to know the reason why you're trying to do this, Mr. Nigel Askey. Problem 3. The many problems with using Overman's study to directly compare military frontline casualties have been largely covered, so we won't labour the points here. Again, he's just hammering the same points we've already covered, so I'm just going to skip to the next point. 2. The comparative strengths of combat forces table used in the presentation taken from pages 383 to 389 of the book When Titans Clashed. Generally speaking, I have fewer issues with this table than the price of victory ratio table, but it is still easy to spot several major statistical manipulations happening here if you have the data available. Yes, we've been over this already, it's the Krivashayev numbers which I've favoured because of the almost month by month breakdown. Unsurprisingly, these manipulations are clearly designed to favour the Soviets' perspective. They mainly concern what constitutes front strength for the Soviets in this table, because this is the only Soviet figure used in the table for all the relative strength comparisons. Firstly, it is apparent that for the Axis side, including all the German allies, the front strength is basically any paramilitary formation they had anywhere on the Eastern Front, including Luftwaffe ground units and, of course, all types of SS units. Again, I don't know why Mr. Nigel Asquet thinks the Waffen SS and the Luftwaffe ground units shouldn't be included, but anyway. Essentially, if it was in or east of the Baltic states, Belarusia or the Ukraine, then it counts. No matter how far to the rear it was, or what it was doing, it is still considered part of the Axis front strength. Thus, for example, any OKH reserve unit sitting in Minsk, many hundreds of kilometres from the front line, are still considered part of the Axis front strength. Similarly, dispersed German security division operating in the western Ukraine in 1942 and thousands of kilometres from any front are apparently still considered part of the Axis front strength. Okay, but from the notes to the table, it specifically mentions units that fought on the front line, and even says some units of certain types didn't fight on the front line, implying that it hasn't included units that didn't fight at the front. Now, yes, the notes don't specifically confirm or deny that it included every unit that the Wehrmacht had in the rear. But the chart is titled Comparative Strengths of Combat Forces. So this suggests that it didn't include rear services units that didn't participate in frontline duties. But Mr. Nigel Asquet thinks he can confirm that it does. We can verify this in some detail as well, just to be sure. For example, my own extensive study of German forces in 1941 shows the entire German force on the Eastern Front up to the 4th of July 1941 had around 3,359,000 men. This includes around 87,600 in the Northern Norway Command and 238,700 in OKH reserve units, some of which had not yet arrived in the East. It includes all personnel in the German Army, including the security units, Waffen-SS, Luftwaffe ground forces, and even naval coastal artillery in the East. 
This figure compares very well with the figure in the table around 3,119,000 derived from Earl Zimke's book which is used as the Axis source in the chart. So you've just confirmed that the chart is accurate, because if we take away the reserve units, then you get the chart figure. But then you say, my higher figure takes account of the dozen or so German division that arrived on the East Front from the West between 23rd June and 4th of July 1941. Right, which we've just taken out because you mentioned the reserves already. Let's put it another way. You've provided a figure of 3.3 million, that is roughly 240,000 men higher than what the chart says. This is because the chart has not included reserves and only frontline combat units. You're accusing the chart of including German reserve units at the front, but as your own statistics show, it has not done that. It has removed them. This is interesting because your own statistics invalidate your criticism of the chart that it was including non-combat units in the figures. Well done. But regardless of this reserve force issue, the chart specifically says that the number of men is for the 22nd of June 1941, not up to the 4th of July 1941, meaning if these extra divisions did appear after the 22nd of June 1941, then it's irrelevant to the chart, which only said the numbers for the 22nd of June. So, the German stats on the chart are correct, and your criticism of the chart in this case is invalidated by your own statistics. Unfortunately, this is clearly not the case for the Soviet side of the table. When reading the small print on the table, it states that the Soviet figures show the strength of the operating armies and fronts in the RKKA at the front. It specifically states that all other forces such as the NKVD, PVO, Navy, possibly including naval ground forces significant in 1941-42, and army units in the rear are not included as front forces, but are included in the figure as parentheses. This is something the presenter in the video completely failed to state or highlight, and yet it is a key point on the whole table if it is being used to compare combat force strengths. You are correct, this is a valid criticism. Thank you for pointing it out. The chart should show the units that actually participated in battle, including the NKVD that fought at the front. So some, not all, of the numbers in the bracket should be put into the main number for accurate comparison, because obviously we don't want to include troops or NKVD that are in the Far East or something. However, considering that you've just been arguing that we have to take out the Waffen-SS, the German police, the Volkssturm, the Luftwaffe field units, and the German security units which fought on the front line, for you to now be advocating that we include all the NKVD units and so on is a bit much. Plus, if this is the only valid criticism you have of my video, then it didn't require an entire 13-page article where you've done your utmost to make it out, as though I have deliberately selected sources in order to distort history in order for you to point this out. If you'd given me a simple heads up informing me that the ratio from this chart would be slightly higher, I could have made a short video explaining this or added a note to the description or pinned comment. With your help, my viewers could have got a more accurate picture of the Great Patriotic War, and I could have accredited you for helping me out. Instead, you chose to be antagonistic and completely dismissed the video as being basically worthless, claiming I was deliberately selective in choosing sources, implying I was distorting history, and then you proceeded to insult me by claiming I have a complete lack of understanding and don't have a properly balanced picture and am simply not a learned historian. I think by this point it should be obvious to anyone why I didn't respond to you for so long and why I didn't feel the need to respond to you. It's not because I couldn't dispute what was being said, but that I didn't think you deserved a response. I also assumed at the time, and part of me still does, that anyone who read your article would be able, at the very least, to see through the flaws in the logic, let alone the questionable language and statistical methods. But what I didn't factor was that my enemies wouldn't care for evidence or solid interpretation and would simply latch onto any criticism of me as though it was the truth. Postmodernism is alive and well. If you had said, tick eats babies, the enemy faction would have believed you. Well, I hope they're watching this and realising the error of their ways. Which I doubt, 
but maybe I've got through to some of them. What baffles me though is, why hasn't Mr. Nigel Asquet corrected any of the obvious mistakes he's made in his article? I mean, his article has been up for three years on his website, unchanged as far as I'm aware, with all these mistakes just sat there for all to see. Don't get me wrong, I make minor mistakes all the time, especially when trying to pronounce foreign names. But on the couple of occasions where I've made huge errors, I've taken the videos down straight away, apologised and redone them. But Nigel has kept his article up for three years, and it has blatant and obvious flaws in it, so obvious that I saw through it straight away, as did several of my viewers, including my patron of over three years now, Jeff, who deserves a bit of a shout out for being the first person to point out the super obvious flaws in the article. Hey Jeff. So why hasn't Mr. Nigel Askey realised that his article is a mop bucket full of mud? Why hasn't he at least rewritten some of it or taken it down and replaced it with a second version, apologising and saying that the first version wasn't any good? Did he genuinely think that his article would stand up to scrutiny? Maybe he can provide us with a second article explaining himself. In the next few paragraphs on pages 9, 10 and 11, Mr. Nigel Askey then continues to explain the point he's already made. Again, I agree with the point, and since he explained the issue in the first paragraph, he didn't really need to reinforce it. But okay, fine. However, as part of this, he goes on to give statistics from his own works. And the problem, of course, is that after reading the rest of this article, he's given me more than enough reason to be wary of his statistics. So I'm going to skip ahead. And since I've already tackled section 3, we're now off to page 13 to discuss some of the other statements he says in the last section. If the numerically superior force concentrates at two or more locations simultaneously on a long front, they can attack with massive local superiority, achieve a breakthrough and encircle the section of the front line between the breakthrough points. Yes, Nigel. And a numerically inferior force can also concentrate at two or more locations and break through in massive local superiority. That's what happened on numerous occasions in World War II on both sides. The Germans did this throughout the Stalingrad campaign, as I've shown several times so far in my Battlestorm Stalingrad series, even though they were outnumbered strategically. This will happen even if the much smaller defending force has a much higher average casualty inflicting efficiency. Stop bringing up the Lanchester Square floor rubbish. The overall losses will favour the attacker due to the encircled defending force elements. Doesn't that also mean that if a numerically inferior force was to encircle enemy units, this would also favour the attacker, like at the Battle of Cannae? Because this has nothing to do with the numbers, but is to do with the tactics. Tactics you can't calculate mathematically unless you are a god. This is the single biggest reason the Wehrmacht casualties were so much higher from 1943 to 45 compared to 1939 to 42. No, the reason why was because by 1943, the Red Army had rebuilt itself after the surprise attack in 1941, where the German army significantly outnumbered the Soviets and wiped out their army before they had a proper chance to react. In 1943, for the first time since the war had begun, the German army faced an opponent that not only outnumbered them, but also actually had enough equipment to call itself an army. During Barbarossa, they'd lost so much equipment that it wasn't until late 1942 and 1943 that they had a chance of replacing it all, and they did that whilst continuing to fight the German army in the field. In addition, the Germans were getting encircled more in the late war because, despite being the superhuman wonder warriors you think they are, they had lost their ability to achieve a local breakthrough. There's numerous reasons for this, poor logistics, the loss of air superiority, the terrible planning, a desperate need to counterattack or attack in order to slow down enemy offensives, like what the Soviets were doing in the 1941-1942 period, etc. The point being, the reason the Germans were taking more casualties from 1943 onwards was because their opponents were no longer as unprepared as they had been previously and were not taken by surprise anymore. The only army in World War II to consistently achieve the above multi-breakthrough scenario while still having an overall average 1 to 1 force parity and quite often even a 1 to 2 force inferiority was the German army Heer. 
They achieved this all over Western Europe and North Africa in the early war years, and in the USSR until late 1942. Yes, it is a lot harder to win against an opponent that is attacking, has superior tanks, planes and other equipment because they built up and prepared for the war years earlier than their enemies, and had the initiative, and often also the element of surprise too. Even at Kursk in mid-1943, incredibly, they were mounted a serious offensive when the overall front force ratio was well over 2 to 1 in the Red Army's favour. Yes, by this point, the Red Army had finally recovered materially from the initial surprise attack, and suddenly the Germans were unable to even break through the lines, which they had done previously when the Red Army was unprepared. Strange that, isn't it? Again, the German army had the advantage in the early days because it outnumbered the enemy and had superiority in terms of equipment. This isn't downplaying the German strategy and tactics. I actually think they did really well in the period 1939 to 1941. However, I'm just not convinced that the only reason they did so well was because their soldiers were superhuman ultra warriors. I'm making a much more realistic viewpoint, saying that the German soldiers were decent soldiers, but nothing special. They had their pros and cons, and they faced largely worthy opponents. But they also had strategic and operational advantages over these opponents by preparing earlier and gaining the elements of surprise. This view says it wasn't the German soldiers that were necessarily superior, but that they had their act together and their opponents were ill-prepared. When their opponents finally got their act together as well, and replenished their losses from the early part of the war, suddenly the Germans found it almost impossible to break through the lines. Nigel Asquet is blaming this purely on the numbers. And yet, Asquet maintains that the Germans were almost always outnumbered. If that was the case, then why did they only have a problem in the late part of the war? Surely, if they failed in the late war against hordes of enemies, then they would also fail in the early war too, when they also faced hordes of enemies. So notice what I'm not saying. I'm not saying the German army of World War II was a bad army. I'm not saying that the German soldier was necessarily bad at combat. I'm actually saying that the German soldier was a pretty good combatant. What I am disputing is the notion that the German soldier was the greatest fighting man the world has ever seen. What I'm disputing is that they faced hordes of enemy soldiers. What I'm disputing is the idea that the German army is somehow infallible and didn't commit crimes against humanity. What I'm disputing is this notion of the Aryan super being and the madman Hitler fallacy, which states that all the problems of the German army ever faced in World War II were because of madman Hitler. Because obviously the Wunderwaffe Wehrmacht never made mistakes. Oh, and we all love Halder and Manstein. Praise be. Let the light of Halder shine upon you, guiding your heart and mind to final victory. As a final comment, I find it remarkable when I read about some of the battles from ancient times and find statements along the lines, Alexander the Great was one of the greatest military leaders of all time, he won the battle even though he was outnumbered by almost 2 to 1. However, for some reason when the Wehrmacht won battles or campaigns when facing similar odds or faced an enemy with a 2 to 4 numerical superiority across enormous fronts for years and without disintegrating and whilst inflicting massive casualties, it apparently wasn't such a big deal because the odds weren't that great anyway. For starters, the Wehrmacht did disintegrate. Numerous times in fact. That's why they lost the war. Secondly, they weren't fighting a numerically superior enemy in 1941. That was why they did so well. Third, I didn't say the odds weren't that great anyway. And I didn't mean to imply, if I did, that the German army wasn't outnumbered at all. What I'm trying to get over to you, Mr. Nigel Asquet, is that this myth that the German soldier was so amazing that he just mowed down wave after wave of Red Army riflemen but there was too many of them, and thus they were eventually overwhelmed. It, it's just that. A myth. The German army did really well during Barbarossa in 1941 because it outnumbered the Red Army, took them by surprise, and wiped out their army. In 1942 it did well because Stalin neglected the southern front in order to defend Moscow and the north, allowing the Germans to concentrate on the south and do a lot of damage. But by 1943, the Red Army had recovered from the initial surprise attack, 
and now had numerical superiority as well. Suddenly, the amazing superhuman Germans couldn't even break through to the operational depths on the battlefield, whereas before they could. That, to me, is very coincidental. It's also apparent that it wasn't just the numerical superiority that was the factor, since the Germans were outnumbered by a similar amount in 1942 as well. But unlike that year, the amazing German Super Aryan wasn't good enough to break through the lines anymore. Despite, as Enduring the Whirlwind points out, this was when the Germans had the most troops and tanks on the Eastern Front. My point in the original video wasn't to downplay what the German army did, but to downplay the myth of the Aryan Super Saiyan. My point was to say, if they were able to defeat the Soviets in 1941, why couldn't they do it again in 1942 and 1943, when the odds were, according to your numbers and the old numbers in general, were roughly the same? Surely, if they were only outnumbered by 2 to 1, and the one guy is as good as 4 or even 11 people, as you yourself claim, then why couldn't they take out the enemy that outnumbered them 2 or 3 to 1? If they were Super Saiyans, they should have been able to do that. And that's it. They're not Super Saiyans. They're good combatants, but they're not as good as the old narrative made them out to be. And they weren't outnumbered by hordes of zombies. They faced a decent enemy at least once their enemy had recovered by 1943. This in turn actually makes the German army even better than you're making them out to be. Think about it. If they faced a weak opponent, like if Mike Tyson beat up a child, then we wouldn't be able to say that he was a good fighter, because beating a weak opponent doesn't prove anything. If, however, a child beat up Mike Tyson, then that child is amazing. You're saying that the German soldier faced a weak opponent and lost. Okay then, the conclusion should be the German army was weak. I'm saying that the German soldier faced a tough opponent, won at first, but then lost in the end. Therefore, the German army did exceptionally well to last as long as they did. So, I'm actually defending the combat capability of the German army in this instance, whereas you are undermining it. And I'm not apologizing for the Soviets or the Germans or anyone, I'm just presenting what I deem to be the best interpretation of history that we have based on the evidence. I'm not interested in which side won. I just want the truth. Because history is the study of the human condition. If we do not get to the truth about history, then we cannot be truthful about ourselves. Thanks for watching. Don't spit out your coffee.